Welcome to First Baptist Church. I'd like to start off this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, it is because of your loving kindness and your care and protection that we are here. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here today for a service. Lord, we, we call unto you to guide this service. Lord, I pray that you would accept, Lord, our, our worship, our praise, and our prayers to you. Lord, let us recognize your spirit in our midst this morning. And as we start, Lord, we may you be glorified from the beginning to the end. Lord, please give us your peace that we may be able to listen to you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to start off by reading a passage of Scripture. It's a bit longer of a passage, but we'll get through it. If you would, join me in standing as I read. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on, notice a direct, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and... As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. These are the blessings, the gifts, the armor that we have as the church of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful when we recognize that these things we get to put on every single day as armor against evil in this world and the sin that we face in our own life. It's a blessing for us to be able to do these things all because of Jesus Christ. He is the one who makes us strong. Let's sing together, O oh, church, arise and put your armor on.
morning. <coughs> you'll see, excuse me, you'll see on the screen where we are uh, as of August 14th, last week with the offering. The difference there, if you're wondering, a different way you can give, you can give online, give.fecmich.org. A reminder again, I've had a couple people ask me to remind everyone, if you're looking to give to the Deacon Fund, you can go to this website, give.fecmich.org, on the drop-down menu, you're able to give to the Deacon Fund on there as well. Let's go ahead and pray right now. Thank God for the offering this morning. God, Lord, we can never outgive you. Lord, as we give you our financial gifts, Lord, help us to use the spiritual gifts that you have given us as well. Lord, we thank you for giving each one of us your spirit to guide and direct us as we use our giftings. Lord, to each of us, you have given different and specific spiritual gifts to serve you and to serve your church, to build each other up spiritually and to share Christ, Lord, with a broken world that needs to see him and needs to know him. Lord, may we serve you financially with our giving and spiritually through ministering with our gifts that you have given to us. Amen. If you would, continue singing with me this morning. Let's sing together, When I Survey the Wonders Cross. slide if you would read the second along with me through the end of the passage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, believe yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's sing together, Immovable Our Hope Remains.
Let's take a few minutes right now for personal, quiet, reflection of prayer for the message. Specifically, for the fact that we have an immovable hope in Jesus Christ. That no matter how many things or people may come and go in our life, situations change, jobs change, finances. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I humbly thank you that we have Christ. That we are built into as we have just sung. Secure. Having a secure place to stand. Or knowing that no matter what happens in this life or beyond it, we have Jesus. I thank you for that. Let us not forget that, God. Lord, as Pastor Pete comes to preach, Lord, let our hearts be prepared for the message. I pray your spirit, your spirit Lord, Lord, speak into our lives. And that we would be tender-hearted to receive your holy word. But as Pastor Pete preaches, Lord, enable him powerfully to convey your message powerfully, accurately, precisely. But I know he's put study. I pray that you would bless that into this and that he would, Lord, be clear-headed to be able to think clearly and communicate clearly. But I'm thankful for your word in our lives. We do not always recognize the need of it. But yet, Lord, that is part of the reason why we have this beautiful thing that we call church. Or being able to come together and worship as a church to hear the word of God, not just sung, but preached. Lord, let us be thankful for this blessing. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Join me in standing one more time. Let's sing together. Speak, O Lord.
excellent singing. Children, you can uh, be dismissed at this time to go down to your class. Take your Bibles, those of you that remain in here, and turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I want to publicly thank um, those of you last week who had a part in our service. Um, it was an interesting weekend. Uh, my fam- Pastor Will's family was already out sick. And then uh, I found out, we determined at 10 o'clock last Saturday night that we as a family were going to stay home sick. And so suddenly it was, what do we do tomorrow uh, without a pastoral staff? And I am so thankful that we are in a church where we have so many gifted people. And I'm thankful for our worship team that they continued on. And I'm thankful for Keith stepping in. And I know the, I know the feeling. And uh, it's something... Uh, Um, that uh, every preacher uh, is capable of doing, but uh, it's still, still, it's a a challenge to do it at the last minute, so I appreciate you doing that. I do want to just make a couple announcements before we begin. Uh, Just a reminder that our First Steps class is uh, this coming Saturday. If you are planning on being there and haven't let us know, please do, Um, and uh, so that we can prepare for that Um, And uh, just let me know or Pastor Will know as well. Also, I want you to be aware of that this fall we have an opportunity that we're going to offer starting on Sunday nights in the fall starting September 11th. We're going to offer a class that you see there called Does God Exist? Uh, This is going to be during when our kids are in Awana and our young people are in student ministries. We're going to offer this for the adults Uh, It's a video series put out by uh, Focus on the Family, and and basically the idea is to ask the question, can you prove God exists? Um, That is a question that no doubt, if you have done any um, any evangelizing, you've probably heard someone ask that question. Because as Christians, it's easy to just say, yes, I believe by faith, but uh, that doesn't always fly with people who uh, want more than that. And so what this video series does is it uh, answers that question um, and it gives you some intellectual answers to respond to that type of question. And uh, it's done by Focus on the Family. I said, like I said, the teacher is a guy by the name of Dr. Stephen Meyer. Uh, he has got multiple degrees. He's an extremely smart man, but he's also a, 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 um, a solid believer. And uh, so I think you'll enjoy that. So Sunday night, starting on September 11th, we'll have that. Um, many of you here, um, as you turn the Bible, the question that I would have for you is, how many of you here enjoy to go fishing? Do we have any people here that enjoy fishing? We have a few. I got a little bit of this from some of you. Okay, uh, let's do a little quick survey. How many of you would say that uh, you go fishing maybe once a year? Have any of those? Okay, how many of you would say you go fishing um, at least 10 times a year? Got a few of those avid people here. How many of you people fish weekly? Any like that? No, we don't have any like that. Okay, how many of you as fishermen have, have caught a fish this big? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, that is, I, I am not by any means a fisherman of any kind. Uh, in fact, the last time I went fishing, I know this because I looked it up in my phone and found a picture that we t- I took on that day. The last time I went fishing was August of 2017. I was, my family was invited to go to Joyce Brown's house. Uh, she lives on a lake, and uh, we were invited there, and she graciously took us, uh, my wife and I, and our kids out onto her boat. And then she handed them a fishing pole, and, and the kids went fishing. So my part was I put the, the worm on the hook and then handed it to my kids, and they did the fishing. That's the last time I did anything dealing with fishing. So you can tell I am not a fisherman. However, that being said, there was a time in my life when fishing was a bigger part of my life. As a young boy, uh, we, my family, for two to three years, my family lived uh, on a house that was on a lake, or in a house that was on a lake, not on it. 
we, we did not have a house of our own. We had just moved to Connecticut, and uh, we did not have a house of our own. And my grandfather uh, owned a second home that was on a lake, and so he graciously allowed us to live there. I loved every minute of living on that lake. I was between the ages of about, um, about six and nine. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but uh, it was the little boy's dream. I spent as much time as I possibly could outside, on, near, or in the lake. I would swim, we would go boating, I would fish, and I loved it. And then in the winter, the lake would freeze over, and we would hop out there, and we'd put on our ice skates, and we'd skate. Here's the only problem with that is is I learned how to skate really fast, going straight. And we would get to the other side of the lake, and then I would run into the snowbank, and I'd turn around and come back. So I have no idea how to stop or turn. I can just skate really fast in one direction. But I, I, one of the things that my brother and I loved to do in the summer was go fishing. I remember times when we would get up early in the morning. The dew was, was still heavy on the ground. The way that, well, where we lived is uh, the, the lake was, and when we looked at the lake, the lake was to the west, and so the sun would rise up, and behind our house there was a hill, and so the sun would rise up over that hill, and it would shoot across the other side of the lake when it was still dark at our house. And we would hop on the boats and early in the morning and we would, we would go off to the, when we went out of our house, uh, off the boat, we would go off to the side and over here was the, uh, an area where it was excellent fishing area. And my, my brother and I, we would row our boat over there and, and we'd throw out our line. Usually it was, uh, our bait was a worm that we pulled out of our yard as we were heading to the boat. We would spend about an hour or so, and usually within the first hour, we would, we would catch a fish of some kind. That lake was filled with, uh, with bass and, and uh, lake trout, and so we usually would catch something. And then what we would do is we would take whatever fish we caught, and we would head home. We would, we would boat back home, and we would get home, and we would walk in the house. By that time, the rest of my family was awake, and we would walk into the house, and we'd take the fish, and we'd hand it to my mom. And then we'd go back to bed. <laughs> and my mom would take that fish and she would prep it and prepare it. And, and at some point, even for lunch sometimes, we would have fish. I love that. But I am not a fisherman by any means. That is not something that I would call myself. Our text today is about real fishermen. So let's read about them in, in Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading starting in verse 1 down to verse 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he, speaking about Jesus, was standing by the lake of uh, Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all those who had seen him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were, were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when he had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for this passage. Lord, this is such an intimate moment between, between your son and one of his followers. And Lord, I pray that as we read through this, as we study through this, we will understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we will be committed to this task. 
Lord, guide my words, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. In this story, we're introduced to four fishermen. Simon, his brother Andrew, James, and his brother John. Now, last week we read about Simon, or two weeks ago now, we read about Simon uh, and his mother-in-law. Remember the story of Simon's mother-in-law being healed. But to this point in Luke, we do not really know much about Simon, who later will be called Peter. Our text is the story of how Christ called Peter and these other fishermen to be his disciples. In the beginning of the story, Peter is fishing for fish, but by the end of the story, the Bible tells us he's fishing for men. Now, I find it fascinating to consider these men that Jesus chose to be his first disciples. Now, if we look at this, we understand that when Jesus was choosing his disciples, he did not go to an executive search firm to look for the best men to lead. He did not go to a local college and and ask the placement office, do you have any disciples for me? He started by calling men who were workers. He called men with dirt under their fingernails. He called men without much education, blue-collar types. He called men who knew about hard work and the value of perseverance, fishermen. Now, that's not who we would have chosen. That's not who today most businessmen, when they're looking for followers, would have gone to. And so I've often asked myself the question, why did he choose fishermen? And I don't know if we'll really ever know that exact Answer, but I do have a thought on that. See, to be a fisherman, you have to have one key important quality, and what is that? That is patience. Sometimes a wife will ask her husband, How can you just sit there uh, by the bank of a lake or in a boat or in a water for hours and hours waiting for fish to bite? And the answer that the husband will give is, It's easy. That's what fishing is all about. And if you can't handle the waiting, then you probably are not cut out to be a fisherman. That is why I'm not a fisherman. (laughs) It is about the waiting. And we see in this story that God calls these fishermen. And the progress of this story is simple. First, Peter caught fish, and then Jesus caught Peter, and then Peter caught men. But it starts with a frustrated fisherman. And so let's look at that. We see this idea of following Christ that Peter is going to do as we get to the end of the story. But what does that look like? And we see five, uh, five characteristics of someone who follows Christ. First of all, following Christ starts with a sense of need. Look back in our text again. Look at verse 1. So we see on this occasion, the crowd is pressing around Jesus. And over on the side here, while he's teaching the word of God, there is these men. These fishermen. Who are they? We know that they're Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John. And what have they been doing? They've been fishing all night. In fact, look at verse 5. Peter says to Jesus, We have toiled all night and we've caught nothing. And they would often go fishing at night because at night the seas were usually calmer. And so it was, it was an easier task to fish at night. And so they could go out, especially if it was a night where, where the moon was bright and they could see. And they would go out into, and, and they would go fishing. And so now we see that they've come and it's now daytime. Now their fishing was not like what we think of fishing. Now, in that time, there was a fishing that was, would maybe, maybe be a, uh, a, a pole and a line. But that's not what Peter was doing here. What he is doing is he's doing a fishing called dragnet fishing. And what they would do is they would take this dragnet from a boat. Oftentimes, it was not just one boat. It would be better if it was two boats. And they would cast this net into the water. And, and, and the net, net had, on the four corners, had a rope on each of them. 
And usually what they would do was this, this net on the bottom of it would be weighted so that when they would throw the net in the ground, and, excuse me, into the water, it would, it would almost make like a wall of a net because the weights would take part of it to the ground and then it would hold it so the rest would stay up. And then what they would do is they would hop into their boat and they'd begin to row the boat. And as they would pull the boat, it would, it would pull on. And the, if there was two boats, it would almost make like a cone shape with this net. And whatever fish were in there would get caught up into it. This is the process of the way they would fish. And they would go a little bit, and if they would pull up uh, the fish into the boat, and, and sometimes there would be fish, and sometimes there wouldn't. And so then they would go back out again, and they would drop the, the net back in, and they would do this time and again, time and again, until they got enough fish where they could call it a day. It was exhausting work. And we see here uh, Peter and, and the others, they're, they're on the Sea of Galilee. And they'd sweated and toiled all through the night. And notice what it says. We have got nothing. Now, maybe this is Peter exhausted and frustrated. Maybe they've got one or two fish. Or maybe they probably got nothing. And now it's morning. And they're tired. They're exhausted. They're dejected. They're probably in a foul mood. And they're over here and they're on the side of the, the lake. And it's tell, the Bible tells us that they're, they're mending their fish. They're, excuse me, they're mending their nets. I have, I've heard someone say this once. They said, uh, your worst day fishing is better than your best day in the office. I don't think that's what Peter's thinking here. So they're mending their nets because sometimes the nets, when you drop it down, it would go all the way down sometimes to the bottom of the lake. And as it was pulled, it would get caught on a rock or it would get caught on something and it would begin to tear. So they would have to come to the side and they have to clean off their, their nets and then they'd have to kind of uh, tie them back together where there was holes and they would have to fix their nets so that the next time they went out, there wasn't massive holes for the fish to swim through. And so this was, this was kind of uh, something they did every time, but to do it at a day when they caught nothing probably was frustrating in the middle of that Jesus comes to Peter and says Peter can I use your boat what's interesting is Peter doesn't balk at it he immediately agrees and 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 he he knows Peter and I think I mean he knows Jesus and I think he admires him greatly I I believe at this point that Peter had become a, a a sort of follower of Christ but until now he hadn't given a wholehearted commitment he was just kind of like, this guy's interesting. I want to hear his preaching. I want to know more about him. I've seen the miracles and I, the, really amazing what he does, but I'm, I'm not ready to just follow him completely. And so when Jesus comes and says, hey, Peter, I want to use your boat, boat for a pulpit. Peter says, sure, go ahead. Now, nothing in this story happens by chance. God allows Peter to go through this personal failure, to go through this this frustrating thing of fishing and not getting anything for him to come to the point where he had this sense of need. Until we see our sense of need, same thing for you and I, until we see our sense of need, we don't need a Savior. After all, if you think you're self-sufficient, why would you need Christ? Christ. And that's the problem in our world today. And that's the problem with even, even a lot of people who preach and teach under the name of Christianity, but they don't want to confront sin. Because until we confront sin, until we understand that we're sinners, then we don't need a savior. And here we see Peter came to this point where uh, he, he was stripped of all of his self-confidence. I mean, he's a fisherman And yet he caught nothing. And Peter had to be broken before he could respond to the call of God. And so we see, first of all, following Christ starts with a sense of need. But secondly, following Christ includes a challenge to obedience. Look at verse 4 and 5. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus preached. We don't know what it was. We can gather from other places, but he finished speaking. He said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down my nets. And Jesus had finished his message. 
he addressed the crowd. And he stops and he turns and he looks specifically at Peter. I, I believe, based on the wording, that Peter was probably in the boat with him. Or at least close by. And he turns to Peter and he says to Peter, Take your boat and row out to a deeper section of the lake and drop your nets. Now, what's interesting as we look at this, the wording tells us that, that Jesus' words can contain both a command and a promise. He, it's not that Jesus is saying to Peter, hey, let down your nets uh, and we'll see what happens. No, there's an emphasis there that Jesus is promising, if you will let down your nets, you will catch fish. And I'm sure after a long night of fruitless fishing, this must have been hard for Peter to believe. And I think we can learn some truths from this. Number one, we can learn that God never gives us foolish commands, even though at times they seem like it. If God pr uh, pricks at you to do something, you're like, ah, that doesn't seem like something God would want me to do. Uh, and, and, and you need to ask yourself, maybe it is. Number two, God intends to bless those who obey him without hesitation. Peter, Peter did that. Number three, I want you to notice this, is that God's greatest miracles usually require our cooperation. There's a, certainly a reason Peter could have been skeptical. I mean, after all, the experience of the previous night was conclusive for Peter, that I put all this work in and nothing happened. And, and as a professional fisherman, he knew this lake. I mean, this was his home turf. I mean, he, he knew this lake better than, than Jesus did, that's for sure, from an earthly perspective. And he knew that sometimes fishermen go out and they spend, and I'm sure those of you who fish on a regular basis can attest to this, sometimes fishermen go out and they spend a great deal of time fishing and they get nothing. And I'm sure Peter was, could have said, hey Lord, I, it's not worth my trouble, I just mended my nets. My boats are in. I mean, he could have looked at Jesus and Jesus, okay here, you're the carpenter. I'm the fisherman. Let's keep it that way. All right? Or he could have simply looked at Christ and said, I'm exhausted. I want to go home. But I love the response that Peter gives. Look again in verse 5. He says, I have toiled night and day. I mean, there's this emphasis here uh, that we don't see just in the words. There's this emphasis of, 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 of an emotion there, of, of, of Jesus, I have, I, have, I have burned myself out. Then notice what he says, but at your word. This has been and this should be the catchphrase of every single Christian. Across the centuries, believers have spoken these words or words like them. Conditions may be dark. The world may fight against us. Circumstances may, uh, may overwhelm us. Our fears may nearly submerge us. But when God speaks, his children must say, but at your word. And off we go in obedience to the almighty God. A middle-aged Abraham set across the desert with no more than a simply, but at your word. Noah built an ark in the face of an unbelieving world with no more than, but at your word. Moses defied Pharaoh looking to heaven and saying, but at your word. Joshua marched around Jericho day after day after day with this thought in his mind, but at your word. David confounded all of the doubting men of Israel by marching into the valley with the confidence, but at your word. And it's not just in scripture. We could go through history and see men and women who stepped out in faith in a scary proposition with simply the phrase, but at your word. I think of a guy like, like William Carey. If you haven't read a biography of William Carey, do it. William Carey was a man who, who, who God con convinced that he needed to go on the mission field. And he said, I don't know about this. But God gave him this burden, and so he began going to the churches in the area, and one by one, the churches around him said, you're nuts, don't go, don't go. And he said, but God told me to go, and so at his word... I will go. Peter adds then to it. He says, but at your word. 
And then notice what it says. In verse 5. Um, he says, um, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Here's the reality. Is when something miraculous happens in our life, it is God who does it, but we have to let down our nets. We have to do something. We have to play in a part. The, the fish aren't just going to jump in the boats by themselves. And I think sometimes that's what we think as Christians. If I just, if I just live a good life, if I just go out and I just try to uh, be a nice person, then, then God's going to bring uh, good things into my life and he's going to bring fruit in my life and, and I'm going to be used by God greatly. But the reality is, is we have to let down our nets. And that takes work. We still have to do our part. There's work for us to do. And I believe that there are many answers to prayer that are just simply waiting for us to put down our nets. Maybe you're a person you've been praying, God, I, 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 I pray that you will give me an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. And I want to share the, I want to lead someone to Christ. Well, here's the thing is you have to put down your nets. You have to do the work. Uh, one, uh, one Senate chaplain by the name of Lloyd o Ogilvie said this, Without God, we can't. Without us, he won't. And Peter could have said, God, that's, that's great. Jesus, that's great. Uh, I'm glad you think I'm going to catch fish, but uh, I'm not going to do it. And he wouldn't have seen this miraculous event following Christ not only includes a sense of need, but it includes a challenge to obedience. Thirdly, following Christ desires a demonstration of divine power. Look at verse 6. And so uh, Peter uh, says, I, I, I will do it. I will do what you say. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. Imagine the scene, if you will. Okay, picture this. If, you got to close, if you're one that has to close your eyes to visualize it, close your eyes. These fishermen, they're exhausted. They're tired. They've had a long day of work. This was not just a simple little easy job, and they're exhausted. But due to Peter's respect for Jesus, he decides he needs to give Jesus a chance. Maybe in the back of his mind, he's thinking about the fact that he saw his mother-in-law healed. And said, if this guy can heal my mother-in-law, maybe he can do something miraculous here. Whatever the case is, Peter, I, I think, reluctantly takes his boat out. And this is not like he hops in his boat, turns on the motor, and sails out there. He hops in his boat. And they begin the tiring process of rowing out to the deep. And rowing, and they get out there. And maybe he gets out there and he stands up in the boat and he grabs his nets and, and, and uh, I believe Andrew is with him and, and they grab their nets and, and, and I can almost picture Peter. He gets to the side of the boat and he's got his nets and he looks back at Jesus and he's like, really? <sighs> Rolls his eyes and he throws the nets in. They hang on to the rope and they get back into the position and they begin to row again. Remember, they have to row to catch the fish and they start rowing. And, and as they start rowing, what happens is it starts getting harder to move the boat. Suddenly, he row, he's an experienced fisherman. He knows what this means, that there's fish in that net. And he's starting to get excited and it's getting harder and harder. And they, they get over there and, 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 they, and they start to pull it in and they can't. And in fact, it's interesting what the Bible says there. It says, if you, if you look there in verse 6, it says their nets were, were breaking. Now, and you have to understand that this gives the idea of they're in danger of losing the fish because you can, I mean, just picture this, if you will. The nets are starting to get so tight. And, and as they're getting tighter and tighter and tighter, you can start almost hearing the sinews of the rope snapping. And holes are starting to be created. And as a fisherman, what do you think is going through his head? We're about to lose these fish. And so in panic, what do they do? What does it tell us in the next verse? In panic, they signal to their partners. I can imagine, here they are. Remember, they're out deep. 
So they're turning and they're yelling, John, James, get out here! Again, it's not like John, John and James hop in their, their you know, speedboat and phew, they got to row out there as well. And they get all the way out there and they're frantic. And this is what fishermen dream about. I mean, they spend a lifetime fishing and hoping that one day something like this will happen. And they get these fish and they begin bringing them into the boat. And it tells us that the boat, both boats were so filled with fish that they begin to sink. Think about that. Two overloaded boats with fish flopping around inside, slowly coming to shore. I mean, this is the biggest catch that's ever happened, and it happens in minutes. Everything in this happened according to the plan and power of God. And I believe that, that God allowed Peter to fail so that he could see what he could do with Jesus' help. So we see the next, what happens is, is kind of interesting. And it tells us that following Christ necessitates a confession of inadequacy. And he's going to have all these fish in the boat. And before they even get to shore, look what happens. Look at verse 9. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O God. Now, this isn't the type of confession that we often hear today. This isn't the type of confession. There's a, if you follow sports at all, there's a sports story going on right now where an athlete got accused of a number of different inappropriate things. And then the, 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 the league that he's a part of punished him. And after they punished him, he got up to give an apology. And instead of saying, I was wrong, I am wicked, he kind of just said, well, I hope you weren't offended too bad. That's normal. That's normal in our world. And, and so uh, you might expect Peter to come in and he'd take the boat all the way to the shore and walk around. Remember, there's a crowd gathered. And he might have been walking up going, hey, did you see what we just did? I mean, that was pretty impressive, wasn't it? I mean, you know, fishermen, you know, the whole, like, I caught a fish this big. I mean, he's like, man, I had a load, and, and everyone's watching. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to brag about it, but he comes in, and instead, what does he do? So the Bible says, instead, he's overwhelmed. It's interesting, in verse 9, it says, uh, and, and, and he, Peter, and all who were with him were astonished. That word astonished actually means that they're terrified. They're terrified by this enormous catch of fish. To fishermen like Peter, a good catch might be 50 fish, maybe 100 fish, maybe even 150 fish. A good day would be 250. And some estimate that the size of the boat, the size of the nets that they had, this haul of fish could have been anywhere from three to 5,000 fish. And instead of puff up, the sight of this huge catch evaporated Peter's confidence and left him dazed and frightened. Here's the thing. Like I would say most of us, we see life in, in man-sized categories. You know, Peter saw life in man-sized categories. Hey, if he went out fishing and, and he put down the nets and he pulled it in and there was 50 fish, he would have been like, hey, that's good. And we do that in life, don't we? If, oh, man, if I, I just want to see God work in this way. And, and, but sometimes our, uh, our, our visions are just man-sized because we don't want to see something big happen because we don't think it can happen. And, but the reality is, is we, we don't look at things from God-sized miracles. 
And he had room in his mind for anything that he himself can handle. But when God got involved, the results blew his preconceived ideas. And then you know what it did? It drove him to his knees in desperate prayer. This scene reminds me of numerous places in the Bible, but one of my favorites is in Isaiah. When Isaiah sees the vision of God and the angels standing around, and, and he doesn't look at that. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we, we think from when we would see that, it would be like, wow, this is great. No, but what does it do? It tells us there in that passage, when Isaiah saw it, he, he got down on his knees and he says, woe is me. I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. And Peter is the same way once he realized who Jesus really was. The true son of God from heaven. He saw himself in a new light. Throughout scripture we see this. When people see God, suddenly it changes the view that they have of themselves. And sometimes the vision is too much to handle. And Peter here could not stand the contrast between the purity and the power of Christ and his own sinfulness. And here's a man who is deeply changed on the inside. Now, does that mean Peter's flawless? No. We'll see that in the rest of the study of Luke. Peter is far from flawless. But yet, what we see here is a, is a man who was changed from the inside. He was, his pride was burned away by the transforming vision of Christ. And it left Peter with only one choice. Let's see that choice. Number five, following Christ is a personal commitment. And this is for all of us. Look at verse 10. It's talking about who was there. In the end of the verse there, it says, And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now, I find something significant about this that's, apt, that's missing. I find it significant that Jesus ignores Peter's sense of, of desperate confession of unworthiness. That's what we would do. You know, if someone comes up to you and says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm horrible, I'm, I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm, I'm all these things, what do we do? We go, no, you're not. And G Peter goes up to Jesus and says, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a wicked man. And Jesus doesn't look at him and go, no, oh, that's not true. Why? Because Jesus knows the truth about Peter. And it's not just about Peter. It's about every single person who has walked on this earth. He knows the truth about you and I, and he's known it all along. It, what, what matters is, is that Peter now knows the truth about himself. And with his pride stripped away, now he's ready to hear Jesus Requests. Now he's ready to hear Jesus call to him. He wouldn't have been ready to hear that if he, would have, if he would have had a fantastic day on the boat. If he would have came in and been like, man, guys, we, got, we caught 200 fish today. We're doing well. Uh, we're going to be eating well tonight. And Jesus would have said, follow me. Peter would have been like, eh, I'm good. But he had to strip him away of his pride. He had to get him to the place where he was, he, he saw Jesus as he was. And there's an important lesson for us to ponder. When we encounter Jesus, we will never be the same. No one can meet Jesus and walk away unchanged. We may end up coming closer to God or we may harden our heart, but no one ever meets Jesus and stays the same way they were before. In Peter's case, his confession becomes part of his testimony. He knew he was a sinner, and he, and he wasn't ashamed to admit it. And he will admit it again multiple times, even though at times it will be hard. And God can use a man who knows his weakness and isn't afraid to hide it. Now notice what he says there. He says, uh, Peter, don't be afraid. 
Remember what it said is when they saw all the fish that says they were astonished, I said that word means fear. And so Peter saw, I mean, Jesus saw that and said, Peter, don't be afraid. And then he says this, from now on, you will be catching men. Now, by trade, Peter was a fisherman. And by all evidence, he was probably a good one. Uh, But now Jesus comes to Peter and suggests, he says, Peter, you're going to change your occupation. The wording in this verse is actually kind of cool. And I want to explain it to you because it's, as I was studying this, I'm like, that's, that's cool. I, I, I like this. It says there, from now on, you will be catching men. The phrase there is actually, catching men, is actually two Greek words. The, the first one there, catching, means to hunt, to catch, to bring in. The second word is, is not just men in the sense of like uh, a physical man. It is, it's the word zuos, which means alive. Do you hear the contrast there? Peter, God is, Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, no longer are you going to catch fish, which means death. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to lead men to life. The contrast there is beautiful because literally the exact translation of this phrase is, he says, you will be catching alive. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, Peter, Peter, you're no longer going to be going out and you're going to catch your fish and you're going to kill them and you're going to take them in and you're going to make money of it. He says, from now on, what you're going to be doing is you're going to go out there and you're going to find men and you're going to find women and you're going to bring them in and you're going to give them life in Christ. And that's the call for all of us. The, 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 the truth is that this new mission that Peter had was famously fulfilled in his life. After Jesus went back to heaven and ascended into heaven, the Bible tells us that on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached. And what does it tell us in that passage? He preached and 3,000 people came to Christ in one day. <laughs> You talk about catching fish. I mean, he's catching something far more important. And catching men for life is a glorious description that should be the, the, the call and the, the, the mission for every one of us. When we encounter Christ, he changes us and he changes our life agenda. If we decide to take Christ seriously, he may end up doing things in us that we never thought possible. I remember as a youth pastor, oftentimes uh, when, when we would have these discussions about with, with young people about God calling them to do something great, many times a young person would come up to me and they would say something like this. What if Jesus asked me to do something I can't? And here's the reality. He will. He always does. If he only, if if God only asked you to do something that you can already do, then you wouldn't need him. But he doesn't do that. He asks us always to do something. See, as Christians, we're so comfortable in in, in our world and in our environment that that we don't want to step out uh, of our comfort zone and go out. But that's exactly what God is calling us to do every single day. Step out of your comfort zone and do something that is beyond you. But when he asks us to do something, that we can't. He gives us the power to do what we thought we could never do. And we end up doing it, but he gets the credit. That's the beauty of it. So the question is, what is God asking you to do that you think you can? And I don't know what it is for each of you. You do. If you're open to God's leading in your life, right now God is convicting you of something that he wants you to do that you don't think you can. And that's exactly where God wants you to be. And, and, and Peter, I mean, Peter was, was good with fishing. Like he knew how to do that. Fishing men? That was going to be a challenge. 
Maybe God's calling you to do something that scares you. Maybe it's God's calling you to go to your coworker and, and that you've been trying to talk to, but you just you, 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 haven't really, you haven't really taken the opportunities that have been there to share the gospel with them. Maybe that's what God's calling you to do. Maybe God's calling you to do something bigger. Maybe God's calling you, you know, this, I told you a couple weeks ago, we're going to be going on a mission trip next year to Peru. And maybe some of you are like, I can't do that. Maybe that's what God's calling you to do. Or maybe it's even more than that. I do not mean to suggest that everyone must give up their careers and move overseas and become missionaries. But perhaps more of us should give that a serious thought. But for most of us, the call of Christ means going back to work tomorrow with a new determination to serve Christ on my job no matter what. Or it means going back to the classroom determined to be a disciple for Christ no matter uh, what anyone else may say or do. Or it means staying right where you're at, even in the midst of your personal difficulties and being faithful to Christ in what God has called you to do that you can't do on your own. Notice verse 11 as we close. Verse 11, and when they had brought their boat to land, they left everything and followed him. Everything. You know what we have to assume? We have to assume that Peter walked away with a boat full of fish. Because what previously mattered, this boat filled and overflowing with fish no longer mattered to him anymore because he had encountered something better and he said I will leave and I will go the word followed there means to walk the same road and that's what a disciple does a disciple says I'm going to walk the same road as Jesus I'm going to get on the Jesus road and I'm going to follow it wherever he leads no, no matter how difficult it is there's no guarantees there's no deals there's no special promises he simply, we simply walk the road every day following our master's steps now let me ask you are you ready to follow Jesus wherever he leads you or are you still content with fishing? Fish. Are you still content saying, I'm, I'm good to just mend my nets, take care of my house, make sure my kids are okay? Or are we people who need to say, you know what, it's time that I start taking steps that are hard for the glory of God. Let's pray. God, I am truly grateful for the example of Peter. Lord, he is not any different than any in this room. He is a sinner who was saved by grace. And he is a sinner who served you by grace and through grace. Lord, I pray that you'll be with those here. Lord, maybe there's some here who you are convicting them of an area in their life where they need to step up and be more of what you want them to be. Maybe there's some in here that you are calling them to, to the greater task of fishing men. Lord, I pray you'll be honest about how you are leading and guiding our lives and be obedient. Lord, I pray, Lord, maybe there's some of us who still are not seeing the true vision of our wickedness. I pray that you'll convict and that you'll work. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a song here. If God's working in your heart, you need to talk to me. I'll, I'll be in the back. If you just need to spend some time alone with God, you can come up to the front and do that as well. So let's sing this song. Go ahead and join me in standing. Let's sing together our closing song today. Glorify thy name. Father, we love you.
that as we go into our week, as we begin our week, that we would begin on the right foot, that we would begin our week basing our lives around Jesus Christ and his accomplishment. Lord, I do pray that if your spirit's working in people's lives, Lord, that we would be tender to that, that we would be open to your spirit's working continually beyond just these four walls. That as we go home, Lord, that we would go back to your word, that we would spend time with you and in prayer, seeking heart change to become more like our Savior and be more intimate with our Savior Christ. Lord, enable us in this way. And as always, Lord, we recognize this is by Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Please be seated. We'll have an announcement video and then dismissed immediately after that. Hey, First Baptist family, glad you could make it to worship this morning. Two announcements, and I'll let you go. First of all, we have the Church Sing and Snack happening August 28th of this month. A special time where we're going to gather together on a Sunday evening, sing some old hymns of the faith, have a snack together. It's going to be a great time. Hope you're able to make it. Second announcement, September 10th we have the church work day i hope you're able to make it we are going to have some projects to do around the building september 10th make sure to mark your calendar 9 a.m that's all i have for you if this is your first time here joining us at first baptist church thank you for choosing to worship with us today make sure you stop by our guest center in the annex there you'll find a gift mug we have set out just for you first baptist family have a great week Thank <laughs> you.